a quorum being present, the committee will, uh, will come to order. And uh, I want to welcome uh, all of the uh, members of the committee who are participating today and thank our witnesses uh, for their agreement to, uh, to appear before the committee. Uh, we're here uh, today to learn about what appears to be a serious fraudulent behavior undercovered by the Government Accountability Office during its investigation into enrollment and eligibility process at some Head Start programs. We will also hear about what actions the Department of Health and Human Services is taking to strengthen its oversight and accountability of the Head Start programs. I am very disappointed that there are Head Start programs and employees at the centers, uh, at the centers of these allegations of fraud. Upon learning of this investigation, I immediately wrote a letter to Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, Secretary uh, Kathleen Sabilis, urging her to take swift action to review the claims of fraudulent activities among some Head Start employees. Secretary Sabilis and I agree that we have an obligation to ensure Head Start is held to the highest standards, which starts with people who enroll the children in the program. One in five children under the age of five live in poverty in America, and less than 50 percent of, of, the, of the children who are eligible for Head Start are able to attend this critical program. So it is vital that Head Start enrollment procedures are followed and the taxpayer dollars are used as intended. Unfortunately, the GAO has found that some Head Start employees are betraying the integrity of the program. The behavior on the part of some Head Start employees that we are going to hear about today is reprehensible and completely unacceptable, and I want to thank the GAO for bringing it to our attention. I believe, I believe the Head Start community will likewise be outraged at this behavior because of the majority of employees that work in Head Start represent the program with integrity and with a deep commitment to help the future of this country. We know that if you invest in children before they enter the kindergarten classroom, they will have a much better chance at success in elementary school and throughout their lives. Head Start receives, a bi receives bipartisan support for billions in federal financial assistance. It is imperative that these programs be transparent, ethical, accountable, and maintain the confidence of the taxpayers. We intend to continue our oversight of this program to ensure prompt and effective enforcement by the Department plus the, and put a stop to the fraudulent co conduct. Head Start works for our children, and we are here today to help make sure that it will continue to do so. I want to thank our witnesses and look forward to hearing about what can, what can, be, what can and will be done to fix this problem, and I want to, again, thank them for being here today. I want to just say on the, on the side that uh, when we had uh, allegations of, of, uh, of, of, of fraud, uh, uh, and maybe embezzlement of funds back in, was it 2004? Two was two th in 2003, this committee responded under leadership of, of uh, Congressman Chairman, then Chairman John Boehner, and we responded in a bipartisan fashion to deal with those, uh, with those issues of program integrity. And I want to thank uh, Congressman Klein and, and, and the Republican staff and others for helping us to work uh, uh, on this problem uh, when we were alerted to it. And, and we've been talking back and forth, and this hearing is proceeding along lines with suggestions and recommendations by Congressman Klein and the uh, uh, and, and the staff. Uh, this program has had, as I noted, tremendous bipartisan support both in administrations and within, throughout the Congress. And it's important that we do what we uh, have to do uh, to maintain the, uh, the integrity of this. But I want to thank uh, the staffs on both sides of the aisle and Congressman Klein uh, for his response to this, uh, to this problem when, when he and I became aware of it. With that, I'd like to recognize Congresswoman Judy Biggert, uh, the senior Republican today. Uh, thank you, Chairman Miller, and thank you, and thank you to the witnesses who are here this afternoon to discuss this extremely important and extremely troubling topic. As the name indicates, the Head Start program is designed to give our neediest children a, a head start before enrolling in school, because children who lag behind when they start school tend to remain behind. Head Start is supposed to help close the uh, readiness gap between low-income children and their uh, more in affluent peers. Uh, after, uh, after my clerking for a judge at the U.S. Court of Appeals and before starting a, a, uh, another job, I volunteered for a summer at the Head Start program in, the, in, uh, in Chicago at Hull House uh, the very first year that this program uh, was offered. So I saw uh, firsthand the value of early intervention uh, in the lives of those that, that are in need uh, and underprivileged uh, children. So that's why I was so disturbed to hear about the rec recent findings of the government accountability. Uh, at that time, I was re rushing home uh, every evening to turn on Sesame Street so I could learn a little more Spanish before I went back the next day to be with these wonderful children. 
Uh, but today we're, we'll, hear to, uh, we'll hear about deliberate efforts to circumvent the uh, program's income limitations, including compelling evidence of, of Head Start centers disregarding proof of income in order to pad their enrollment, absorb funding for children who were never served, and continue uh, and c collecting a larger share of Head Start resources than they were due. And this is not a victimless crime, every dollar that goes to higher income children or to centers not serving as many children as they claim is a dollar that cannot be used for the low income children this program is meant to serve. The GAO, GAO investigation sampled but a few of the roughly 1,600 Head Start uh, grantees across the nation. Based on these preliminary findings, it is clear that uh, further re review is necessary. Indeed, it's my understanding that investigations by GAO and other authorities are ongoing. For that reason, I believe that this is important to go on record to express reservations about the potential uh, consequences of a, of a public hearing. The cases we'll review this afternoon are part of an undercover investigation. In such cases, it is, it is important that neither the identity of those who are targeted in the investigation nor the ad identities of undercover agents posing as prospective uh, enrollees be compromised. We've, uh, we've received assurances from Chairman Miller that steps are being taken today to conceal individual identities and localities. And with those assurances, we are able to move forward today. Uh, I think that we can all agree that additional congressional oversight, including future hearings, uh, will be in order once these investigations are, are complete. And the full results of GAO's work uh, can be revealed. It is vital for Congress to expose and root out any this type of waste, fraud, and abuse, but I do not believe that any of us wishes to jeopardize an ongoing and potentially criminal investigation. In fact, I and many others were so uh, troubled by these uh, preliminary findings that we believe the investigation into these specific incidents and the investigative authorities ought to be broadened. Upon being informed of the GAO's preliminary findings, uh, Congressman John Klein, this committee's senior Republican member, wrote to the Department of Health and Human Services uh, Inspector General to request a comprehensive investigation into the vulnerability of Head Start's uh, verification processes to fraud and abuse. And I echo his concerns. The uh, GAO has brought to light a disturbing pattern of, uh, pattern of abuse in a program designed to serve our most vulnerable children. And I expect that the GAO will uh, continue its important work in this area, and I'm pleased that this investigation will be bolstered by a more comprehensive review by the agency's independent uh, watchdog. And I will uh, insert the panel Thank you. into the record. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like now to introduce our, our panel of witnesses for this hearing. Uh, Greg Kutz is the uh, managing director of the GAO's Forensic Audits and Special Investigations Unit. Mr. Kutz has joined GAO in 1991 after eight years at KPMG Pete Marwick. He previously served as a senior executive at GAO, where he testified over 80 times at congressional hearings on matters related to fraud, waste, and abuse, and other special investigation. Mr. Coots graduated from the Pennsylvania State University in 1983. He is a certified public accountant and a certified fr fraud examiner. Carmen Arnazio, uh, Nazario, 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 I'll get this right. Okay, thank you, my apologies. Is the Assistant Secretary for the Administration of Children and Families within the Department of Health and Human Services. During the Clinton administration, she first served as Associate Commissioner of the Child Care in the Administration of Children and Youth and Families. Ms. Nazario has held a number of leadership roles, including Vice President of the Board of Directors of the American Public Welfare Association, President of the National Council of Local Public Welfare Administrators, Secretary of the National Council of Human Service Administrators. Ms. Nazario graduated from the University of Puerto Rico in 1967 and was awarded her Master's in Social Work degree from the Virginia Commonwealth the University School of Social Work in 1993. Uh, welcome and thank you for your, your uh, willingness to be here today. Uh, as you know, the lighting system, Mr. Kutz, uh, Ms. Nazario, we, we'll, we'll put on a green light and, and, uh, and a yellow light. This is a little unusual, your testimony, you have other parts, so take the time that you've deemed necessary to fully explain the uh, case to us and we'll make t likewise time available to you, Ms. Nazario, so you can testify in, in the manner you're most comfortable. Thank you again. Mr. Kutz. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Head Start program. Today's testimony highlights the results of our investigation into allegations of fraud and abuse. My testimony has two parts. First, I will discuss the results of our investigation, and second, I will discuss the consequence of fraud and abuse in this program. 
First, we are investigating allegations of fraud and abuse that we received on our hotline related to two nonprofit grant recipients. Specifically, 11 informants provided us with numerous allegations of fraud and abuse. It is important to note that enrollment of children from families with incomes over 130 percent of the poverty level is generally limited to 10 percent. Thus, with some exceptions, 90 percent of families must be under this income level, which in 2009 was about $24,000 for a family of three. A key allegation is that grant recipients are manipulating records to enroll over-income children into under-income slots. This is being done to fill open slots that were intended for children from families with incomes below the 130 percent level. Key findings to date for these two cases include, at one grantee, staff encouraging parents to apply as homeless, which results in automatic enrollment. 353 of 1,587 children at this grantee are enrolled as homeless, or 22 percent of all children. For the other grantee, 63 children were moved between centers so that they could be double counted. The incentive for management here was to boost enrollment so that they would not lose any of their $13 million of Head Start grants. Based on these two allegations, we decided to perform undercover testing across the country to look into this issue. The primary scenario that we used was to provide evidence to centers showing that our bogus children and families were over the 130 percent of poverty level. We refer to these as our over-income tests. Using bogus children and fabricated documents, our undercover testing was done in centers in California, Texas, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. Seven centers in four of these states and D.C. fraudulently enrolled our over-income children into under-income slots. We also successfully enrolled children using bogus documents showing that we were under income. These tests clearly show that the Head Start program is vulnerable not only to grantee fraud, but also to beneficiary fraud. Here are two examples of what we found. First, as you can see on the two monitors, on the top you see the W-2 we provided for our fictitious parent, Vinnie. Notice on the bottom that rather than record the $23,000 of wages, Vinny was recorded in center records as being unemployed. Exclusion of this $23,000 of income made Vinny and his family under income. That's just what it's up back here. In the next case, the monitors show on the top left $23,000 of wages for our fictitious grandfather, Gary. On the top right, you see the $9,500 of wages for Grandma. Once again, the $23,000 of wages for Gary were excluded from center records. As you see on the bottom, the only income recorded in center records was the $9,500 of wages for Grandma. In this case, the Head Start em employee who perpetrated this fraud agreed with our undercover agent that, and I quote, Grandma wins, end of quote. At the end of my presentation, as was mentioned, we will play audio excerpts showing Head Start employees facilitating the fraudulent enrollment of bogus over-income children into under-income slots. Moving on to my second point, 450 of the 550 Head Start centers that we contacted had waiting lists. The parents we spoke to on these wait lists, assuming they were truthful, were generally under-income. Some were unemployed, while others were making $200 to $300 a week. My concern is that over-income families fraudulently enrolled are being served while the poorest children in our country are on wait lists. Without Head Start, the parents on these wait lists told us that they cannot work. They fear that their children will enter kindergarten substantially behind their peers. 
This, Mr. Chairman, is the answer to our so what question today. In conclusion, the victims of fraud and abuse in the Head Start program are not only taxpayers, but more importantly, children from the very poorest families in our country. I fear that enrollment fraud is not the only fraud in the Head Start program. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you and this committee and HHS to prevent future fraud in the Head Start program. I will now play audio excerpts from several of the undercover visits to Head Start centers. You will see the transcription of the conversations on the monitor as you watch. I need to look at your income. What's your income? That's what I need to look at. Both of these are for 09. Together, combined wages for 09. And you have three. Hmm. This is over income. Okay, you're fine. You're going to use this. Okay. Oh, so what do I need to do in the application then? Um, you can put him on there, but he's, I mean, you don't have to put his income on there. Okay. No, I'm not going to. Uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 So now you see it, now you don't. Now you see it, now you don't. We're not doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got an appointment on? Um, I'm employed. You're employed? Yeah, part time. Part time? Okay. Oh, okay. okay. The big school time. I mean, it really doesn't matter since you're in the same household and um, I don't have to use both of your income. Uh, you have to? I don't. I don't okay. Have to, you know, which it, it really doesn't make a difference, but they give priority to the people who have less income. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Okay. Did I win or did she win? <laughs> Who won? Grandma or me? Grandma. She had the lower income. <laughs> <laughs> I took that one. I'll tell her Grandma won. <laughs> How many are in the family? Three of us. Yeah, because then with her income, you would be eligible right now. Yours and hers together would make the over income. Okay. So. Thank you. No problem. Mr. Chairman, that ends my statement, and I look forward to your your questions. Secretary Nazario. Chairman Miller, um, members of the committee. I think your, is your microphone. There you go. Is that it? Yeah, if you pull it a little bit closer to you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Miller and members of the committee, I am pleased to have this opportunity to appear before you today to discuss GAO's overview, uh, review of selected Head Start grantees. I appreciate this committee's longstanding support for the Head Start program and know that you, like me, are deeply disturbed by GAO's report. According to GAO, employees in approximately eight Head Start programs appear to have determined children eligible for services despite evidence that their income exceeded the eligibility limits. The Head Start program is designed to move our nation's low-income children along the road of school success. Diverting funds to children who are less needy is quite literally stealing away that opportunity from children who need it most. I want to assure the committee that we take these allegations very seriously. As soon as we were given the names of the grantees, we referred the cases to the Inspector General. The OIG has directed ACF to refrain from taking action against these grantees while the investigation is pending. I want to assure this committee that we are partnering with both GAO and the OIG. In the meantime, we have taken immediate actions to bolster our program integrity efforts. Yesterday, the Secretary sent a letter to every Head Start grantee to underscore the serious nature of these allegations 
and notify them that the department is intensifying its oversight and enforcement actions. On May 10, the Office of Head Start issued a program instruction designed to remind grantees of their obligation to verify income and encourage them to retain copies of verification documents for review and provide annual training to all employees responsible for income verification. In addition, we will take a number of actions in the coming weeks to strengthen federal oversight, including conducting unannounced monitoring visits, creating a web-based hotline that will allow those with information of impropriety to report directly to me, developing new regulations that promote program integrity, increasing oversight, particularly of grantees with identified risk factors, issuing proposed regulations to implement a new system for recompeting grants to improve quality and ensure integrity, implementing an important reform enacted in the Head Start reauthorization, and continuing our partnership with the Inspector General to conduct in-depth reviews of high-risk grantees. At the same time, we are in the process of conducting a top-to-bottom review of our program monitoring, erroneous payment study, and risk management process to determine how we can improve program oversight. While we have significant oversight and data collection mechanisms already in place, they can be strengthened to fight fraud and promote program integrity more effectively. These efforts represent one aspect of our overall Head Start Roadmap to Excellence and Effectiveness. This roadmap is designed to raise the bar on quality in the Head Start program. Additional elements of the roadmap include strengthening the Head Start performance standards and improving our training and technical assistance systems. The department commitment to strengthening program integrity is not limited to reacting to fraud allegations in a particular program, but is a broad-based priority for preventing, detecting, and prosecuting as appropriate fraud in all our programs. Last week, the Secretary announced the formation of the Secretary's Council on Program Integrity to look systematically across all parts of HHS to determine how we can strengthen our fraud and error-fighting efforts. I share the Secretary's commitment. A core part of ACF's strategic mission has been promoting a culture of integrity from the highest levels at ACF to the local level where children and families are served. I am establishing an ACF Office of Program Integrity chartered to strengthen internal procedures and improve grantee financial management and fiscal integrity in all ACF funded programs. Each year, Head Start programs provide almost one million of our country's most vulnerable children with a much needed chance at success. ACF is committed to ensuring that all program resources are used appropriately and that every slot is filled with an eligible child in need. We are eager to work with the GAO, Congress, and our grantees to ensure that we capitalize on every possible opportunity to strengthen Head Start and to help eligible low-income children prepare for success in school and in life. I am confident that we can achieve these goals together. Thank you. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And I would just say to, to members who may have joined us, um, this panel uh, may not be able to answer some questions that members have at this stage of the investigation because uh, this investigation has been referred uh, to the Office of Inspector General and the committee is, 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 is working to be cooperative with uh, GAO finishing its study and the Inspector General's investigation and, and the department and, and the, uh, 
the Secretary Sebelius has made it very clear that she intends to pursue this uh, in a very forceful way. So again, members should feel free to ask whatever questions they want, but it may be that uh, either the witnesses defer for the moment uh, because of that, uh, that investigation. And again, we've, we've talked to uh, Congressman Klein and staff about, about this. Uh, if I might, uh, the universe of your investigation are programs uh, without a waiting list. Is that correct, Mr. Coots? For the undercover testing. For the undercover for testing. programs without a wait list, yes. At and the time we did this, which was between September 09 and March of 010. You know, the other rush period of June, July, August, we did not test during that period. There would be a lot more places with wait lists than or open spots. Do that again for me. Well, we, our testing started in September, the September. undercover testing of 09 through March of 010. So I think a lot of the evidence we've seen is that the big rush to recruit and get kids into the programs happens right before the school year starts right. in the June, July, August time frame. So I think there would be more centers with openings then, but we looked at places that between September and March had openings at that time. Well, the, what you presented on the, uh, on the audio tape uh, is people, various people in, 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 in different programs uh, uh, appearing to, uh, uh, to, to doctor the, uh, uh, the income requirements. Is that correct? I would say they didn't appear to. They did. They told okay. us to commit fraud. I don't know how you want to handle right. these, these questions. <laughs> Very clear. Uh, but we don't know at this stage anything about what's behind that. Is that correct? With we have these to, actions on, on. Correct. With respect to the undercover testing, we do not know whether management instructed these employees to do it. At the two case studies we have from our hotline allegations, part of that allegation was management was pressuring staff to boost enrollment through various fraudulent. That was the that was the unsolicited uh, call on the hotline. Correct. The two hotlines are that. The other okay. one, since they didn't know know who we were, what we were doing, we don't know the motivation behind it. Except there was wait lists and open slots. All right. Um, in the uh, um, the other one was that it, it appeared that, uh, in reading your report, that documentation to support the decisions to make somebody eligible or not, uh, that documentation, uh, uh, those files weren't complete. That, that it may be that income records uh, were dis had disappeared, or well, you want to explain that? The requirements are, are were fairly loose, and I assume they're tightening them up as part of the uh, discussion here today. But in the case of, of Vinny, for example, they disregarded a W-2 showing twenty-three thousand dollars of income. That was a common. So it's not just that they 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 chose Grandma, or they or or they disregarded Vinny's income. The documentation disappeared for the income that was excluded, right. correct. It was it would have not in the file. And in fact, they went in, Mr. Chairman, and actually checked that Vinny was unemployed. We saw that in numerous cases. So they made the income go away, and they wrote into the file, unemployed. These files are kept on computer? These files are kept in paper folders? What's These appeared to be handwritten uh, in enrollment files that are there for the applicants being made. We went back in after we did our undercovers as GAO and ask for the records related to the bogus children we enrolled as if we were investigating the children and their parents. And that's how we got the evidence after the undercovers showing that our children were enrolled and that the parents had had income excluded and that they were checked off in some cases, for example, as being unemployed. But those are not computerized files? They may have, most of them looked like they were hand filled out okay. application forms uh, in the, the center question, The question came as also whether or not children were being double enrolled. As you, as I read your report, I don't know whether or not one center could check that enrollment against a master enrollment role of, of that region or city or whatever, how they do it, uh, whether there's any ability to do that or not. Well, there's a, that's an excellent question. And one of the reasons it's very difficult is because they don't keep social security numbers for these children. So you have very little information in the files about who the children actually are. So it'd be difficult to determine in some cases whether children were being double counted. But one of the cases we got on our hotline, we've substantiated at least 63 children were counted twice, meaning the government paid for them twice effectively, or they justified their grants from two different funding streams. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Nazario, uh, you point out in, in, in your testimony, I'm looking at page 13, I don't know if that is with, reports with your, your version, but uh, this, this question of, of, of re-competing programs has been around the Head Start community for a long time. 
Uh, and it, uh, it came up again, as you point out, in, in 2005, because we had these incidents in 2003, 2004, and the general discussion about uh, the competition within the programs. And then in, in 2007, again, as you point out in your testimony, this committee in particular, and on a bipartisan basis, uh, was insistent on, on the recompetition of these programs as part of, the, as part of that, uh, uh, that reauthorization. So this kind of incident raises questions about how we will then decide the, uh, uh, that reauthorization. And I raise this not to get a definitive answer from you, but uh, you point out in your, on your testimony later that uh, you, you, uh, you anticipate publishing a notice of proposed rulemaking uh, describing the designation of renewal system and our transition plans for continuous grants on a five-year basis. Uh, as it's explained today, and I'm, I'm not taking this as a final c conclusion, but as it's explained today, it appears that the system is not set up to detect fraud. And we don't know enough about whether children are being double counted or we don't, we, we don't require sufficient documentation of income, or at least it appears that it can disappear and that, that may, I don't know if that's in violation, we don't know whether that's in violation of requirement or that's just done or what have you. But if we're going to talk, uh, talk about whether or not a program is required to be recompeted and whether or not it's sufficient for it to compete and win again or, 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 or to be awarded the grant or what others are competing against, I think we have to look in light of this investigation, whatever its outcome, it raises some very serious red flags about the requirements for program integrity as part of that recompetition, you know, and and uh, you know, unfortunately, most of the money taken out of the uh, you know out of Medicare fraud comes through doctors' offices. I mean, you know, it's not people going in to get a shot and a hip replacement voluntarily; <laughs> they get charged for it, but that doesn't happen. So here we have people running the program, apparently involved in in the fraud. And we're talking about tightening up and making this program more competitive to hopefully get better programs out of the program and perhaps better alternatives for those grants. I just would, before we rush to publish in, 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 in this summer, uh, uh, I would raise that, that concern. And I don't know if you want to respond, you're, you're certainly welcome to. We absolutely agree with you, Mr. Chairman, on all of those uh, counts. The system right now, this is why we're so grateful for this information, because we are going to now work to find out where it's happening, how much it's happening, and stop it. Uh, we in do intend to issue the two sets of regulations. One is to strengthen what we just issued now as a program instruction. In the program instruction, we are encouraging grantees to maintain the source documents, because you are absolutely right that the current regulations do not require them to maintain the source documents. So it's, it's not a violation of the requirements not to keep it. It's a violation of the requirements to lie and ignore it. Right now, what the grantee has to maintain is a form that is the verification form where the uh, Head Start associate certifies that they have looked at the income source documents but they are not required to keep the source documents. Uh, the new regulations will indeed require them uh, to maintain the source documents. And that is a separate uh, rule than the one on recompetition, which we are also working on, that is long overdue in terms of being able to weed out the non-performing programs so that the high quality programs will be certified as a star grantees. And like all members of Congress, I'm going to put competing agendas here. We obviously want the program integrity part of this, and we don't want recompetition to go without it. Correct. But, but we also do not, we want recompetition. It was a very serious matter and a, and, a, and a very heated debate, as you know, in this Congress and for this committee, it was a very serious matter. We want that recompetition in place as soon as possible, but clearly this has to accompany it. Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Bigger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Kuntz, um, your, your testimony talks about a number of investigations. I think it was around 15, and that there were eight that were found uh, to result in misrepresentation or, or fraud. 
that uh, that seems to be a, a certainly a high rate uh, of fraud for such uh, for a limited sample. But is there anything that that these results tell us about the system in general, or about under enrollment programs in in particular? Yes, I believe that. By design, it appears that the system is vulnerable to fraud, and, and you mentioned the grantee fraud, mm -hmm. but also the beneficiary fraud. Some of our enrollments, actually, we just walked in with basic counterfeit documents saying that we were under income and there were no questions asked. They checked the boxes and they said, you can start tomorrow. So I think that both the system is vulnerable to both grantee fraud and beneficiary fraud. Is there, uh, and it seems like most all of the uh, paperwork was handwritten. There was no computers that were used for all to keep records of anything. I can't say that, but most of the documents that I've reviewed that we got back were handwritten. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would that be something as far as having a, a uh, uh, maybe a standard program that has to be filled out for for all of these uh, enrollees? Perhaps, and again, certain things now are only voluntary or uh, encouraged. They're not mandatory. So if you want consistency across centers, you're going to have to mandate certain requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, and you stated in the investigation that, that began in October of 2008, um, do you know how, fa uh, how far back uh, the alleged misconduct um, goes? At one of the two centers, it's back four years. The other one is several years. So this potentially goes back uh, into the 2006, 7, 8 time frame. Well, we, um, when we did the reauthorization, was there anything that, that we did that, I, I don't want to say incentivized doing this because it's uh, absolutely wrong, but made it easier for, for such fraud? I don't know. I mean, one of the things that came up I mentioned is the, the homeless issue mm -hmm. and the definition of homeless. And they were actually 22 percent of people at one grantee, which is a large grantee with 1,500 or so children, are in that center as being homeless. Now, I believe part of that's perhaps fraud. Part of it may be the need to tighten up the definition of what is constitute homeless. Homeless, in this case, is not people who are not living in a home. It might be a single mother living with her boyfriend who may be making $100,000 a year, but because they're called homeless, they're automatically shown as effectively under income. Okay. Uh, then, thank you, uh, Secretary Nazario. Uh, in your uh, testimony, you mentioned that uh, you can require immediate corrective action for a Head Start Center if the evidence does not support uh, termination of the grant. Can you elaborate on, on what actions might be included and how often any remedy of the remedies uh, have been utilized in the past? We were, um, I was looking at the last three years and we've had uh, about 10 centers per year where they have been terminated uh, as a result of corrective action going back uh, 2008, 9, and 10. Um, we can reprogram the money, we can recover the money from the grantee, the money that has been misspent. We can, uh, if it's simply a matter of under enrollment, um, we can give them technical assistance so that they can um, convert into an early Head Start Center or uh, that they begin a longer uh, school day or school year. But if it is mismanagement, we take uh, disciplinary action and, and uh, either uh, uh, terminate them or suspend them. You, you stated that since uh, you learned of the GAO uh, review, HHS has taken immediate action to bolster the integrity uh, of the programs. Uh, when did you first learn of this investigation and, and when did the first action to bolster the uh, program in, in integrity occur? Um, the first briefing, I believe, was April 22nd um, of, of 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, we already had a partnership with the IG's office where they do in-depth review of grantees that we consider to be high risk. And we provide them, this has been going on since 2007 uh, with just a couple cases. And then in 2009, they began uh, working on 25 percent, I'm sorry, 25 cases uh, of the grantees that the staff considered to be high risk. Um, and so, you know, we have that even prior to this investigation starting. Uh, but 
from when we knew about the investigation, we immediately issued the program instruction uh, to remind grantees of their obligation to verify income. And the secretary, as I said, has sent letters to every Head Start grantees. We developed a web-based uh, uh, mechanism, so it's called Strength and Head Start so that grantees can share ideas on how to promote sound management, and that's already in place. Um, so those are things we've already done, but in the very short term, we're going to do a webcast to go over the program instruction that we have issued so that grantees understand very well uh, the income verification PI. And we are going to do a web hotline so that that's overall for all of ACF programs in addition to the Head Start program. Uh, to collaborate in um, fraud and mismanagement uh, notification directly to me, to my office. Um, and as I said, in the summer we plan to issue the regulations and we are very uh, cognizant and agree with the chairman that they have to be inclusive of the fraud and mismanagement. Uh, uh, thank you, my, my time's expired. Thank you very much. Um, you know, when this program started 45 years ago, Many of the poverty programs were using rather maybe state-of-the-art at that time, which are quite archaic now. But uh, if we had better technology, could we not centralize and, and spot maybe an inordinate number of homeless people in a program? Would that be of some help? Absolutely. Not only uh, for HHS to have that visibility, but for Congress to have that visibility. That would seem to be something you and your staffs might want to see, that uh, various information across the country about wait lists, homelessness rates, people with disabilities, children with disabilities enrolled, just so you can see across the country what's going on. I would think that information could help not only from a management perspective, but from a fraud perspective, because I don't think 22 percent passes the giggle test anywhere. Sure. Because I think, you know, our, with our technology, you, you could ring some bells, literally, right? when. Uh, you saw certain numbers that seem to be not uh, ordinary numbers, and you could check, maybe they were appropriate, maybe they were not, but I think we might want to look into better technology for this. Um, how much of this was due to uh, th that agency uh, fear of losing dollars uh, for their agency, and was there any evidence of, of sweetheart arrangements any significant uh, arrangements of sweetheart arrangements, bringing people in whom they knew did not qualify, but said, by the way, there's a good program over here. Either one of you. How much was just to fill out the slots that were assigned to that agency to, to, and to serve and to receive dollars for that? Well, the allegations we received and what we see is the incentive to boost enrollment so that they do not lose any of their grant money. And so it's all about the dollars and it's all about uh, almost like head start and head count and making sure you have enough people to fill the slots, even if you don't. And that's where the pressure came in, where you did see, I, see, I saw emails, for example, from management saying, we've got to look at some of these over income and see if we can turn them into under income. Let's call some parents and see if they're willing to say they're under income. You know, things like that. So there's pressure, especially perhaps in the time leading up to the September period uh, when you're trying to get enrolled for the beginning of the year. But even after that, you see some of the centers where they were trying to fill their slots. It was middle of September, late September. They almost panicked and said, hey, we're short of 10 or 15 kids. We've got to do something about it. You indicated that uh, not only did you detect enrollment fraud, but other types of fraud. Could you go into that uh, further with us? Yeah, there were a lot of allegations, almost too many to ever investigate in a lifetime because you never know which ones are credible. But the boosting of enrollment seemed to be the most prevalent. But let me give you some other examples. Um, and I mentioned we substantiated the moving children around to double count between two separate funding streams. Intimidation of staff to get them to do this kind of boosting of enrollment. Manipulation of the in-kind contribution, that's where the centers have to come up with in-kind matching contributions. One of the allegations was they were using the hours parents used at home to help their kids do schoolwork as an in-kind contribution, for example. Allegations of family vacations taken with Head Start money, I mean, you name it, there were a lot of different allegations out there, but the most prevalent were related to the boosting of the enrollment with ineligible children. Um. To what degree, at this point, is 
criminal charges, uh, are criminal charges being pursued in this area of Head Start? Uh, well, as with any investigation, we do dozens of these investigations for committees across Congress. We identify hundreds and thousands of cases of fraud. We refer these to law enforcement, and in this case, the HHS IG will get an official referral from us, and all evidence that we've cr collected to provide this investigation for Congress will be provided to the Inspector General, which is what we always do. And typically, these things result in action. Uh, whether anyone can get a prosecution out of this, it depends on whether a U.S. attorney is interested or not. But that doesn't mean the fraud wasn't committed. Fraud is fraud. Very little fraud is ever identified. Very little fraud is ever actually taken to a U.S. attorney and prosecuted <coughs> successfully. So hopefully, in several of these cases, we will see some consequences. And one fear I have is that the employees will be the ones blamed in these cases, and management will claim they had nothing to do with it. And what you saw in the videos there, I have to believe management knew what was going on and perhaps encouraged those people to do that to fill their roles. Mm -hmm. To what degree uh, could the change in regulations by the department uh, uh, help uh, minimize what's going on now, the fraud? The current change or the 2007 changes? The changes that you could implement now. I mean, oh, well, I think that what they put on their letter, and what again, the devil is in the details, but we agree that a hotline for management would be one way for them to weed out bad actors and get information from employees or parents where there is fraud. We certainly believe going in on a surprise basis, the unannounced federal reviews is important because, again, the allegations are they know when these people are coming weeks and months in advance, and so there is allegations that they're doctoring the records up for the federal review. One way to perhaps deal with that is to show up on a surprise basis. And of course, the undercover visits that we made, there's nothing that says management can't do a little bit of that on their own to keep people straight out there. Uh, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Kurtz, as I understand it, you mentioned a lot of different allegations. The only allegations you actually investigated involved enrollment fraud, is that right? Primarily enrollment fraud, and there was a little bit on personal use of automobiles that, although it doesn't appear to be a lot of money, it appears to be substantiated at this point. Um, the tests were done only at programs where there, in fact, was no waiting list. Is that right? There were open slots, correct. Okay. Um, is there any evidence that the fraud, enrollment fraud, involved the enrichment of employees? That is, that the employee involved in the fraud made money? We saw no evidence of that. Is there any evidence that the fraud resulted in free favoritism so that the relatives, friends, or associates, associates of the Head Start employees benefited to the detriment of others? I believe there were allegations of that, but we have not substantiated that. Because the only places that you investigated, in fact, had waiting lists. The two Head Start centers that came in through our hotline, there was some allegations of that, but we've seen no well, evidence. I'm, I'm talking about the ones you investigated. The undercover ones, we did not do anything except the undercover visits. So you have no evidence based on investigations that any Head, any Head Start employee um, looked out for their relatives, friends, or associates to the detriment of anybody? No, else. we've come up with no evidence of that ourselves now. Okay. Um, Ms. Nazario, can you uh, tell me how much money is stolen in Medicare and Medicaid fraud? I know it's a substantial amount, uh, Congressman, but I don't know. Round numbers? More than the total Head Start budget? I probably. Probably. I would okay. be stuck. Absolutely. I mean, most people estimate it's double digits, low double digits, and that would be more than the Head Start program substantially. Good. Um, now that uh, this, um, these irregularities have been made known to the um, department, uh, you mentioned that you're going to be doing professional development to make sure that the programs know that this is serious? Yes, sir. And that uh, will you be doing random checks and audits to make sure that uh, the programs are complying? Yes, sir. We do that routinely. Every um, three years, at least every three years, every program is audited in depth. Uh, we will now increase the monitoring uh, and conduct unannounced visitation. 
and that um, the programs will be warned that they can lose their um, program, that they will not be renewed if they are caught um, with these irregularities? Yes, we will instruct them of the consequences of fraud and mismanagement. Um, and is, do you feel that um, the irregularities which seem to be widespread based on the um, random checks uh, can be um, fixed with this uh, professional development, random checks and warnings about funding? We will absolutely look at every possible way and, and we'll have that website for other ideas to correct the situation, including um, recoupment of funds from the grantee. And do you think this will be, the things that you're doing will be sufficient to fix the problem? We are going to stop it. We are going to find the mechanism to be sure this is not occurring so that slots are not taken away from poor children who do need it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank both of you for your testimony here today, Mr. Kutz, for, for your good work in a number of different areas in, in the GAO, whom we rely on so often. Uh, Ms. Navario, how long have you been in your position? I arrived September 26, 2009. Okay. The system that you have in place now for program oversight, is that something that was inherited by you, or is that something you implemented on your own? The system was in place, what we've been doing since I arrived and since the new Head Start director, Yvette Sanchez Fuentes arrived, is to, as I said, do a top to bottom review and we established the Red Start, Head Start Roadmap to Excellence, which is looking at everything Head Start, standards, monitoring, technical assistance, we're turning the tables upside down in how we do technical assistance. Uh, so we're looking at revamping the entire system. We call it the new Head Start. And how many people would you say are in your integrity uh, department? You know, in the department that's responsible for the integrity of this program, the monitoring of the funds? We have, I would say, um, I have to count <laughs> about, I can get you the exact number, but we have 60 people in grants management, and we have a total staff of Head Start of uh, around 229 Head Start staff. How many Head Start programs around the country? Uh, we have. 1,600 grantees and approximately 3,300 programs. So 3,300 programs and 60 people uh, that are monitoring them? And am I, this is grants management, am I correct? Okay, Okay, all right. We'll give you a while to. And uh, 229 Head Start. That includes regional program specialists. Uh, we also have contractors who assist in technical assistance. Okay, I guess my question is how many people on your staff dealing with program integrity are actually available to go out and implement some sort of a system that would make sure this doesn't happen because of the complaints that we see today? Well, the way, it's hard to say full time because the way we operate is that for the monitoring reviews, we build teams who then go to the grantees and spend a week with the grantee looking at, and these are not people who are full time uh, on integrity, but are pulled to do the reviews in addition to the fiscal accountability staff. When you took over and started your top to bottom review, uh, did you consult the GAO or any other uh, investigative type body for how you might go about setting up systems that would prevent this kind of a abuse? Uh, we have not, to my knowledge, consulted GAO, but we consult the IG and have a, an ongoing partnership with the IG. And did the IG make recommendations to you as to what standards or systems you might put in place to help you make sure this didn't happen? Uh, one of the, the things that we have already put in place uh, try to address that, but there is a lot more that we can do and will do. As we have received this information, we have uh, uncovered even more things that can be done and we'll put them in place. And do you think you have the personnel that will enable you to do the type of job that's necessary to stop this kind of behavior and, and assure Congress that it won't happen uh, with any regularity in the future? As of this moment, we have not identified the need for additional personnel, but we will be looking at that and will uh, submit requests accordingly. And will you be relying on GAO for any advice and counsel in this process? Yes, absolutely. We, we want to partner with both the IG and GAO. I guess the point of my questioning is that you know, we have an, a special resolution here that when we have money in trust as we do for a program that people on both sides of the aisle uh, have confidence as a potential to lift people out of a bad situation and provide a service, 
we have a special obligation to make sure that the money just doesn't go south on us. Uh, we were neglected enough in the Department of Defense, which is only about $296 billion overspending on just 93 programs. And we do it, as somebody else mentioned, Mr. Scott mentioned on uh, Medicare and Medicaid or whatever. But people are always looking, sometimes for the narrowest little areas on that. So we have to make sure that we're resolute and get this in place. So I just urge you, and I congratulate you, first of all, for doing your top to bottom review. I understand that it takes time, but let's make sure we nail it down so we don't spend our time debating this, but rather time in debating how the program is implemented and whether or not it's working and, and who it's benefiting on that, and I would be appreciated on that. And I, I really do think you should use GAO in an advice and counsel role in addition to the IG. Uh, they have the systems in place and they have the, uh, the way to help you through that, and it's important that we do it. We Thank completely you. concur, sir. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, now yield to the uh, gentleman from uh, Kentucky, uh, Mr. Guthrie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And Mr. Coots, I, I was uh, been watching and, and looking at the testimony. One of the concerns, you said 8 of 15 undercover, undercover investigations of Head Start employees actively encourage undercover investigators posing as parents or guardians to misrepresent their eligibility. And in four of those cases, the information that was provided had been doctored by Head Start. Employees to remove income information have been provided. And I know that's correct as what you said. And the question is, you said at least four. And I wonder if there were more th than four. And so you had more than a 50 percent, I wouldn't say success rate, but, but people, your undercover investigators were over, 50 percent of them were able to enroll fraudulently. And in your experience as an investigator, is this typical in these kind of environments? Is that a high? Do you think you can extrapolate to what well, this means pervasively? And then finally, does how wet, widespread do you think this may be? It's hard to tell whether um, widespread-wise, I think as I mentioned earlier, the, the system is vulnerable to not only grantees doing what we're talking about, but some of the undercover tests we did, we went in actually with documents showing we were eligible. They were just bogus documents, and they would have bought our story. We could have walked in and said we were unemployed, and they would have bought that. So it's, it's vulnerable to beneficiary fraud in addition to the grantees on their own without our prompting telling us, hey, you're over income. Here's what we do to make you under income. Give me that one pay stub, and I'll pretend I didn't see it. So you had both of those things ongoing. So the system's vulnerable. There's no way to tell how widespread this is, but it's particularly vulnerable for those places that are trying to fill empty slots so that they can maintain their grant funding. So that would be, we looked at this between September 09 and March 10 on the undercover piece. Many of the schools were, or the places were already full probably by the beginning of September. You probably have another period of vulnerability come up like in the next few months. So the timing of this hearing and the actions here is very good because the rush to recruit and enroll is coming up this summer for the next year. Well, there's a difference in my mind if, if an investigator presented fraudulent documents and said, I'm eligible to have this and presented documents they were so, and the Head Start accepted that versus the Head Start employee helping you be fraudulent in, in your submission. Absolutely. I mean, that's what you're saying. Did, so, so they're vulnerable to, for the, uh, did you just say I'm unemployed and they took that? For your word, or you're saying you submitted fraudulent unemployment Just documents? Just fraudulent pay stubs or said we were unemployed where we were under income and so forth. Most of our tests were on the over income because that was really the primary focus. But we also wanted to see if there was any due diligence done, if they ever asked us for Social Security numbers, any of that kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. and again, there was very little requirement for any of that type of documentation. I will say there was a lot of requirements for dental records, medical records, things like that. So, and that gets into the non-fraud issues, which are also very important to the program. Okay. But just in my mind, uh, it's a little different for the Head Start employee if you present something and they take it. Are they required to go two or three steps further? Or is that, are, they, are they meeting the requirements and the problem is the system? Or are they, is that right? Absolutely. I don't think they're okay. required to validate anything. They're required to get paper. It's a paper process. You get mm -hmm. paper or someone tells you something, you write it down and you move forward. And that's a problem with the system, but I'm not necessarily a prob problem with the employee. But also, but it is a problem with the employee if they're telling you not to submit Correct. pay steps and so yes, forth. Yes, that's fraud. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to both of you for, for being here. I wanted to go back to the recompetition requirements. And I think that you were speaking uh, to the chairman about that earlier and trying to understand some of the, the issues, particularly for those grantees who have had a you know a long-standing record, and then there are some a number of issues that are that are coming forward. Um, could you just expand on the pending regulations then that were part of the authorization passed in 07, and um, 
talking about the automatic indicators and what, what will change in light of these GAO findings now? Well, I, as, um, we will issue regulations that will take into account public comments and we will take those public comments very seriously. Uh, we want to issue the regulations that are fair, but that are also provide for swift action for recompetition so that the poorly performing programs are weeded out and the high performing programs um, remain. Because when you allow programs to continue to serve indefinitely, then the children are not receiving the best care uh, mm -hmm. possible. And so we want to be sure that grantees meet performing standards in terms of quality and at the same time performing uh, in terms of financial and management standards. The automatic indicators that you're looking at now, have those, as a result of, of some of the work that you've been sharing with us today, uh, do, do you see those changing? Those have more to do with management or more to do with performance? Uh, I or think both. Combination? I think both, a combination, and I will be happy to get you a statement for the record uh, as to what those would be, but we, we should be issuing uh, the rule very soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you, you think, when, when are those coming forward again? In the summer. Maybe. In the summer, okay. Could you, could you talk a little bit more about some of the deficiencies that could can't cause a grant to be rebid? What, what sorts of things are we talking about? Uh, right now or in, under the new rule? I think I will, I will uh, get um, a statement you know, for you for the record. Okay. All right, is that something that, that you're talking about both performance and both management, yes, correct? Yes, Okay. Is, is that something that's not known to people? I mean, when you're saying to get well, it. Well, the new rule is still being developed, and so okay. I hesitate to speak about it. You know. But when it comes out, it will come out for substantial public comment. Mm -hmm. Do you think that grantees are going to be able to um, understand why that might be uh, new yes. indicators. Is that something that is going to come as a surprise, do you think, or is it something that they would recognize pretty, pretty I, easily? I think they will recognize it. First of all, we already have issued a program instruction that gives very clear indication of where we're going. We will then also issue a rule that uh, makes the program instruction mandatory, and then we'll issue the redesignation a rule. Mm -hmm. So by this time, we will be doing uh, webcasts and we will be doing training, and so it should not be a surprise. Do you think that that discussion um, that would be held with grantees, whether online or, or otherwise, um, would it address the trying to get at fraud and abuse in the system? Absolutely. Directly in terms of how, why, why something's being done? Yes, and it will give indications as to what are the actions that will result um, from you know, a worker on her own doing something and what we expect from the grantee mm -hmm. to correct it, and we will require swift corrective action on the part of the grantee, even if it is a rogue worker. Uh, is it likely that there will be more um, recompetition as a result of this? Yes. across the board for, for grantees? Absolutely, like the chairman said, we will be mm -hmm. sure that it's included. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, just very, very quickly, you mentioned the keeping track of the information, and I, it just struck me why we're not doing that now. You said it wasn't required that they keep um, some of the information that's presented, some of the paperwork, et cetera. Well, you know, I wasn't here when these rules were um, developed, but we're always struggling in public services, um, particularly in social services, to walk the line between being responsive to people's needs and maintaining sane administration. And so the way it has been developed up to now is that they had to look at the eligibility 
documents, but they were not required to keep them in the record. Yeah. Well, do you think it's going to be difficult be. for them to do that? Is there, w no. Will they be able to computerize that so that they really have all that at their fingertips, essentially? Well, at this point, you know, we haven't looked into the details of whether it's going to be computerized files or manual files, but at any rate, they will have mm -hmm. something. And right now, um, they should be able, they will be able, both the grantee and the parents, to furnish the documents. They have to have them in order to uh, apply. So they have the documents, and the grantees can even scan them, which is now right. very commonplace. Right. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, first of all, I want to thank both of you. Okay. Uh, you know, um, I know that HHS is very angry over this. That's good. You should be angry because it's a program that you supervise and that you care a great deal for. And thank God for for the GAO. I've been in Congress for for 34 years, and uh, I've learned more when GAO gets involved with the other parts of government to make sure that uh, the taxpayers' dollars, and those dollars meant for in this instance, poor children are used properly. So I'm, I'm sure that with the attitude both of you have, and the beliefs that both of you have, that we're going to get to the bottom of this and, and take those reforms that are necessary to make sure that this program reaches the goals that were set 45 years ago. The last official action I had with Ted Kennedy, I was chief sponsor of the reauthorization of this bill. and. Uh, Ted and I went over to the White House with Mr. Enzi and George Miller, and uh, George Bush signed the bill. We felt very proud, and it was only about a month later that uh, Ted Kennedy discovered that he had that fatal illness. And um, I think one of the greatest tributes we can pay to his memory is to make sure we get this back where it should be, and I know both of you uh, want to do that, and I appreciate that. Without objection, members will have 14 days to submit additional material or questions for the hearing record. And without objection, the hearing is adjourned. Appreciate it. Okay, no, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.